8.2, the continuation of the law of cosines. So previously we looked at side angle side where we had two sides and the angle in between them, which we couldn't use the law of sines for because we didn't have an angle and its opposite side that were both known. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go into case four, which is where we are given the three sides, but no angles. We can use the law of cosines for this because we have three different equations that relate all three sides to an angle. So we can choose which one we want to use and solve for the angle. Now that we have an angle, we can then use the law of sines to find another angle because we have an angle opposite the side since we have all three sides. So we can find a second angle by doing the law of sines and then the third angle we can find by using the sum of interior angles. So let's just jump right into this. The only real difference with how we do this is we're going to have to solve into this equation a little more. Whereas with side angle side, we just chose the one that used the correct sides and angle and it pretty much gave us the missing side. With this, we're going to have to choose which equation we want to use, plug in all the sides, and solve that equation to get the desired angle. So let's do an example. So side A is equal to 25.4 centimeters. Side B is equal to 42.8 centimeters. And side C is equal to 59.3 centimeters. And we want to solve this triangle. First thing I'm going to point out is if you remember back to when we first started talking about the law of cosines, I talked about the fact that we need to make sure that we actually have a triangle. And how we do that is we take the two smaller sides and add them up, and that better be larger than the longest side. Well, 25.4 and 42.8, we're already up to 67, so 68.2. It's longer than side C, so yes, we do have a triangle. And there's only one triangle that could have those three sides. So that's going to force our angles. So let's draw the information that we have into a diagram here. So we've got A, B, C, B, A, C. And we have side A is 25.4 centimeters. 25.4 centimeters. Side B is 42.8 centimeters. And side C is 59.3. Now remember, I never do these drawings to scale. I do my generic triangle. I plug those in. Obviously, this can't be to scale because this is over twice the length of that. And in the drawing, it looks about the same. So don't get yourself confused by what your triangle looks like. Go through the math and see what it turns out to be. Now, when we are dealing with side, side, side and using the law of cosines, we want to be careful about where we start. And the reason I say that is we have an advantage when we're dealing with cosines versus sines. That advantage is if we look back at the quadrants, all students take calculus that sine is positive in the first and second quadrants. So an acute angle and an obtuse angle can both have the same value with sine. So that's where we can get our confusion. Whereas cosine 
is positive in the first quadrant and negative in the second quadrant. So there can't be any confusion there. Which means when we're dealing with three sides and trying to find an angle using the law of cosines, if we start with the largest side, the inverse cosine will tell me whether that's acute or obtuse because it recognizes the difference, which means that when I go on to the law of sines, I still have the two sides that are shorter that have to be acute. So that saves me the concern of, oh no, do I have the ambiguous case or not? Because for cosine, it's not ambiguous. It will tell us if this is an obtuse angle or not. So that's where I like to start with it. Now, do you necessarily have to start with the longest side to get the largest angle? No, in reality, you don't. I could choose any of these to find my first angle. I would then switch over to the law of sines. If I didn't use the largest side initially to find the largest angle, when I do the law of sines, I'd have to be careful not to use the largest side there because then I would be at risk of the ambiguous case. And then I would go to the sum of interior angles to get the third side. And if I did, if I chose correctly for law of sines, then that third one would come out to be correct and give me the value I need. But I can save myself any sort of risk just by taking the largest side. So that's my method. I'm going to take the largest side and go for the angle opposite it for my first one because I know that's going to tell me whether it's an acute angle or an obtuse angle. Then I can choose whichever one I want to use the law of sines. And then the third one is just found by using the sum of interior angles. So I look at this and I go, C is my largest side. So C is going to be my largest angle. So I'm going to use the formula that, or the equation, that includes angle C. So now I'm going to start plugging th things in. I'm going to start over here this time, just because this could be messy and then I'll work my way across. So I have C squared, so that's 59.3 squared is equal to A squared, 25.4 squared, plus B squared, 42.8 squared minus 2 times a 25.4 times b 42.8 times cosine of angle c so that's what i'm trying to find so now i'm going to grab my calculator 59.3 squared is 3516.49 equal to 25.4 squared 645.16 plus 42.8 squared is 1831.84 2 times 25.4 times 42.8, so 2 times 25.4 gives us 50.8 times 42.8 gives us 2174.24 times the cosine of C. So what am I going to do here? Well, I'm trying to get C by itself, so I'm going to subtract 645.16 from both sides and 1831.84 from both sides. So I'm just going to do that right now. So I have 35, 16.49, and I'm going to subtract 645.16, taking me to 2871.33. 
and then I'm going to subtract 1831.84. 1831.34, subtract that, which now leaves me with 1039.49 equal to negative 2174.24 cosine C. So I'm going to divide both sides by that negative 2174.24. which gives me negative 0 0.478, continuing on, is equal to cosine of C. So C is equal to the inverse cosine of this negative 0 0.478, dot, dot, dot. Remember, I leave as many decimal places in as I can, so I use the number directly from my calculator. So the inverse cosine of this C is equal to 118.5609 dot dot dot. Our angle, we don't have any angles, but our measurements are to a tenth of a centimeter. So I'm going to go to a tenth of a degree. So C is equal to 118.6 degrees. 118.6 degrees. So I've now found my first angle and notice that it is obtuse. And my calculator told me that because cosine recognizes acute angles and obtuse angles because cosine is positive in the first quadrant, angles between 0 and 90, and negative in the second quadrant, angles between 90 and 180. So that worked out nicely for me. Now, I can choose either other angle to use because I know they both have to be acute because I already found my largest angle. So I'm just going to grab one. I'm just going to grab B and I'm going to use the law of sines. So I have C and angle C. So I'm going to go 59.3 over the sine of 118.6 degrees is equal to, so I'm going for B, so 42.8 over the sine of B. So the sine of B is equal to the product of the diagonal divided by what's opposite. So 42.8 times the sine of 118.6. So 118.6. The sine of that is approximately 0 0.87798, etc. So multiplying those together, I get 37.57767 dot dot dot, etc. And I divide by 59.3. And I get approximately 0 0.63368 dot dot dot, continuing on. That will work, right? The sine of B can be that. So I'm going to take B is equal to the inverse sine of that. So the inverse sine of that is 39.3227. Now the dot continuing on. Again, we, do, we chose to have degrees to the nearest tenth. So B is equal to 39.3 degrees. So 39.3 degrees. Now that I've used the law of cosines to get my largest angle and the law of sines to get a second angle, I can now use the sum of interior angles to get the final angle. So 118.6 plus 39.3 gives me 157.9. So angle A is equal to 180 degrees minus 157.9 degrees gives us A is equal to 22.1 degrees. So 22.1 degrees is my final angle.
And the answers do make sense because the shortest angle and the smallest angle is opposite the shortest side. The largest angle is opposite the largest side. And it all works out. Now again, remember we like to list everything in the same spot. So A is equal to 22.1 degrees. B is equal to 39.3 degrees. And C is equal to 118.6 degrees. Now you may ask why why bother marking it all in one spot? Can't I just go here and box in C and box in A and box in B and isn't that sufficient? It may be, but look how confusing all this gets. It's much easier for someone reading this or trying to get your final result to be able to look in one spot where you have all of the values that you've solved for right there waiting for them. So it's a lot easier. And I understand too, it's like, well, I wrote them in here, isn't that sufficient? To be honest, writing them in the triangle quite often makes it very difficult for, it to read, for people to read them. It's a little bit better here because I'm on a large board, so in person I can see it very well. Whereas even on the screen, you might be having difficulty reading this 118.6. If I look at my screen, I'm not sure. That could be 136.6, 118.6. It could be any number of values. So doing this makes it very easy for people to see what you've done and what you came up with. Now remember, what did we do here? We had side, side, side. So we had three sides and no angle. So we chose to start with the largest side, finding the angle opposite that, because we knew that was the only one that had a chance of being obtuse, and cosine will tell us whether it's obtuse or not. Then we went, and we don't remember, you only do cosine, the law of cosines once, and then we went to law of sines to find another one. It didn't matter which angle I went for next, because they were both guaranteed to, be, guaranteed to be acute because we had already taken care of the largest one. And then the third one, we just went to sum of interior angles. So you always go for the easiest method that you can to do each piece. Could you technically use the law of cosines to find all three of these angles? Yes, but why would you do that to yourself? We need the law of cosines to start with because we don't have any angles. So we have to use law of cosines to find an angle. Do that once, be done with it, and go to law of sines, the next, easy, the next easiest thing that we can do to get another angle. Then go to the easiest thing we can do after that, which is just sum of interior angles. So you never have to use law of sines more than twice in a problem. You never have to use the law of cosine more than once in a problem. And if all go, and if all goes well, you'll be able to use the sum of interior angles somewhere in there. But if we're dealing with the law of cosines, you'll use the law of cosines once, you'll use the law of sines once, so I keep it once, and you'll use the sum of interior angles once. So it will actually get easier as you move along rather than harder. So that covers case four, side, side, side.